On this Friday, March 17th episode of Locked on Cavs, we're going to talk about what's Jared Allen's season been all about, Ricky Rubio and Jetty Osmond, and other bench things. It's a new episode of Locked on Cavs coming to you right now. You are Locked on Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook partner of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com backslash Locked On today to get started. All right, Chris Manning here, Evan Damerill here. We are Locked On Cavs. Mm-hmm. We're in a giveaway season right now. Get up to 5,000 subs. We're giving away a Ricky Rubio bobblehead. Probably the most handsome bobblehead that has ever existed, if I'm being honest. I don't think that's an inaccurate statement, no. Um, the Donovan Mitchell one's pretty good, too, but we have that one stashed away for a later date. But yeah, get us to 5,000 subs by the end of March, and we will send you our forever thanks, as well as a physical possession in the Ricky Rubio bobblehead. Yeah, that'll be fun to get us there. Let's get let's get a bobblehead. All right, uh, the music in the way is from our friends at Astro Radio. Jake Stevens, as always, is on production all right, Evan, segment one today, we're going to talk about Ricky Rubio and J.D. Osmond, the minutes for them this year, minutes mm-hmm. from the future. Segment two, Jared Allen, his season so far, what they're missing from him. And a take that I have that I think is like, when I've talked to people about it, like, I think people seem like annoyed at me about it. And guess what? <laughs> they're wrong. Segment two, segment three, excuse me, Danny Green, why he hasn't played, maybe was the Philly game the game to play him and what that says and also what to watch for in Cavs whiz. But Evan, this, this first segment is your little golden shot. We t- you kind of said, you looked at me the other night, you said something about this. So explain to me what you're thinking in, in regards to how Ricky Rubio and J.D. Osmond exist. So obviously when Ricky Rubio is 100% healthy and he is shaking the rust, and I think we saw in his last game against the Hornets, he saw a little bit of that rust being shaken a little bit. But it's just he doesn't provide you the shooting in theory that you need and that you really need if you're the Cavs. And whereas Jetty Osmond, who's on a bit of a tear as of late, is showing a bit of that hot streak. And maybe you should reward that play, especially because you saw against Philly, even though it was a loss, how beneficial and crucial spacing was to keep pace of the team that was so three point accurate is the word I'm looking for. I feel like the Cavs took more threes, technically speaking. But either way, like if Rubio just sometimes doesn't look like he has it, why don't you come playoff time? Pencil and Jetty Osmond is like... So instead of J.B. Bickerstaff saying they have a core seven set for the rotation, it's a six with Karis LeVert being your sixth man. And then you see how it goes with obviously Rubio being the seventh option off the bench primary in the playoffs. But if he doesn't have it, give those minutes you're planning on giving to Ricky to Jetty so that you can maybe build a little momentum there. And I'm going to ape off your point before you even get it. Like, yeah, you can still play both of them, but maybe you just pull back from Rubio because you're able to supplant that playmaking aspect with Garland and Mitchell out there. And you get a little bit more of a shooting bump with Osmond instead of Ricky. Where I think I would pull for Jetty minutes more so is, is probably Lamar because Lamar is going to be the guy that stands in the corner and is supposed to space, but he's a guy like we saw Philly put and beat on him. I don't know if Philly's necessarily doing that with Jetty, even though Jetty is not like the, the the shooter that puts the fear in God in you like mm-hmm. like some others around the league. I think like there's the question too of like okay if Karis Levert plays really well and like obviously the numbers and I and I think the tape on Levert Rubio lineups have not looked particularly like they look they just don't seem comf- super comfortable with each other mm-hmm. and like they kind of overlap in some ways I wonder if like that's where you go okay like maybe we'll play Levert plus Jetty and and we ride that way I I feel like this is like a very this could be like a situational thing I I think the way Rubio has played of late would give me optimism about where he's going to be, what he's going to be able to contribute the rest of the year. I think he's looked a little bouncier as mm-hmm. much as Ricky Rubio ever looks bouncy. He's at least like getting a little bit of lift on his shot is probably the better way to put it. Yeah. But like, I, I think the spacing thing is true. It's just like, you might need a game where you need a guy who's just willing to, to, to light it up from three and take a bunch of shots. I just tend to think that the, the minutes I would pull from and where I think JB would probably pull from if I'm putting myself in kind of his shoes is probably mm-hmm. from Lamar or Dean Wade in hy- hypothetical more than I would say it's from Ricky. 
Okay, yeah, I think that's a fair way to pull it, and I think there's ways to figure this out, too, just in terms of the rotation, and we're going to talk about Danny Green as well, and especially maybe his use. Like, he's a guy you could put in the conversation, too, because we talked about it after the Philly game the other night, where if Danny Green is maybe 100%, you would probably play him more than Jetty in some situations, just because Green is a little bit more, or maybe a lot of bit more, passable on defense at times, but... I, I, the way I look at it, at least, is Lamar has played well as of late, but he's subbing in for Evan Mobley, clearly. But I think, like, come playoff time or maybe end of regular season time, he goes back into that wild card mix, and I'd still put Jetty above him as well, just because, like, he makes more sense. And as, like, Dean Wade just continues to struggle, and Ricky Rubio sometimes, like, will play five minutes or he'll play 20 minutes. It depends on whether or not Bickerstaff's comfortable with it. I'm just, I think I'm just advocating at this point, give Jetty a little bit of a longer leash and see if you can play through some of the defensive issues just because of that shooting upside. I think you have to, like, very much pick your spot. I, I don't think that's wrong. I think you also just need to, like, very, I think what would happen is you pick your spots because there are games where I think that it, like, I think the Philly game, him playing 30 minutes was, like, the right call. Mm-hmm. I think that made total sense. Oh, yeah. I... I think there are other games where it's just like, I don't know if you can survive his defense. And I think like pulling the right levers with him is the whole thing. It's the whole thing. It's like, do when do you deploy him correctly? Do, when do you give him that leash? And it's like, I, I think one of the things is like, I would give Okoro a longer leash at times too. I, there's times where like, you've seen him give Lamar the longer leash. Like Lamar against mm-hmm. the, the, in his breakout Celtics game, like just got the longest leash possible because he was playing really well and he rides that momentum. And I wonder if there is like a game five against the Knicks or the Nets or something where like Jetty just like absolutely cooks and like he hits a bunch of those threes where like the defender has the hand up and in his face and it's a real contest but or contest but he just like lets the shot fly and sticks it because like sometimes he has a knack for making the really hard shots and then like airballing the ones that are like staring him dead wide open Mm. I I don't know here's the Jetty question do you do you is he scalable in a playoff series defensively? Like, do you think like like if you put him in a seven game series against like the Knicks or the Nets, and then beyond that, obviously you're getting to whole different territory. Mm-hmm. How does he function as a two way wing in those series? Does he like give you enough two way functionality where you feel good about a long leash? See, that's also a really good question, just because. How comfortable are you with Donovan Mitchell taking this defensive jump? Like, yeah, Isaac Okoro can give you some of that perimeter bump too, but like Donovan Mitchell playing well can maybe mitigate some of it. And then if you're playing like Osmond with Mobley and Allen, and I would just assume those two get a lot of minutes come playoff time, especially against like a team like New York or shoot if they play Boston in the second round or Milwaukee, depending on just how this weird season will end. But I would say, yeah, I trust him enough, but it depends on the. This is where it doesn't feel like I'm fully confident, but. What personnel you surround him with as well? I would say I I think he is the of the guys that I th- of like other other theoretically gonna get minutes. I think he's the one that has like the least like kind of proven like two way ness. But he's also the one with like the most offensive. Like him and Lavert are the two with like okay like maybe they go off and swing a game. Lavert is just playing much better defensively. Yeah, than, to his than credit, Jetty's. he has been. And he also offers ball handling and, and kind of some creation in a way Jetty does not. So, like, he's just kind of in a different class, I think, at this point. Among, like, the fringe guys, so it's, like, Lamar, Dean, Jetty. I think Jetty has, like, the highest, like, offensive ceiling as far as, like, a sw- could swing a game guy. I The other side would scare me if i'm if i'm the coaching staff i like i i just i wonder like how like if if what happens against philly and to his credit like there's some possessions yeah. in that philly game where he like there's one in the second quarter that steve jones tweeted out that i thought was i had just like not caught it real time and and like he pointed it out and that's one of the beauties of watching games back it's like jetty sticks with Embiid, and they like the team defense was so in sync and he bought into that there's also just mm-hmm. times where like He's leaving a shooter open the corner. Oh, and yeah, the George like, Diang and then yeah, um, later in the, just hap- exploding everything. Yeah, Shake Milton happened in the fourth. Like, but if that happens in the playoffs, is it Dinwiddie? You know, is it um, is it like Emmanuel quickly? Like, is it one of these guys that's like not the star, but like could absolutely kill you in those spots? And that's where my that's where all my trepidation comes from, Evan. It's just that, and it's I, like I think that's fair. Yeah, and I and then you get into like the, like if you played the Bucks in round two, let's say, who, buddy. 
Whoo, buddy, he's going to need to be like the best defensive version of himself to hang in that series. Otherwise, Pat Connaughton's going to just like rip threes on his head. The idea of rookie season Jetty Osmond under Ty Lu needs to manifest if they play Milwaukee in the second round. So this episode is brought to you by Nissan. And we're giving you the Nissan most electric player of the week. And it's brought to you by the all new all electric 2023 Nissan Aria. Evan, I think this week we have to give the Nissan most electric player of the week award to Karis Levert, what a run Ooh, he's currently on, and, and and what a game he played against the Philadelphia 76ers. Yeah, in terms of electricity, Karis Levert was nothing but electric off the bench for the Cavaliers, and we have been talking about it a lot since the calendars turned to March, but he has been a catalyst for Cleveland in the fact that he's just doing so much more and can provide so much more for the Cavs come playoff time. He has been, I think, electric. He's been powerful, and that's just like the Nissan Aria. This is a car that is the it is like the perfect SUV crossover. It delivers on duality, the combination of fierceness and elegance, beautiful but strong. And the 2023 Nissan Aria packs pin to your seat power and premium intelligence all in one EV. That's the E. It's the EV for people who love to drive. The all new, all electric 2023 Nissan Aria. Shop now at NissanUSA.com. Evan, let's turn our attention to Jared Allen. And I sure. want to say at the top, this is not a trade Jared Allen segment. This is a let's just have like a, a nuanced Jared Allen conversation at this point in the season. Uh, Yeah, for full disclosure, we did talk about trading Jared Allen, Jared Allen when Bart Rickman is on the show. But that was more about just the fact that maybe Evan Mobley continues to level up. And this is a problem by the time Allen's contract is almost up where they sent him to a mini extension many years down the line at this point. But like right now, no, it's not that. But Allen has had a little bit of an off year, at least comparing it to last year and this kind of second full season with the Cavs. I think he's just it's just been a slight step back. It's been a slight step back for me. I don't think he's been bad. I just don't think he's been the impact he was last year. I think there's logical reasons for that as well. I, I mm-hmm. think if you look at Jared, like Evan Mobley has surpassed him. I think Jared Evan Mobley is just better than him now. I think there's that. I think his usage rate last year was a career high, and it's now down back to where it has been for most of his career. Donovan Mitchell came in. He's getting fewer touches. He's not getting the post-ups. Like, that's a little bit different. I'm sure that has something of an effect. I also think there's just been times where he feels like and looks like he's a little bit out of position and maybe isn't recovering in the same way he did last year. And like mm-hmm. those are margins. The, the, his two-point percentage, a little bit down. His, the, the analytics have him just like a little bit worse this year. He's still like an impactful player who fills a lot of gaps for you and does a lot of your dirty work for you. It is mm-hmm. just, it just feels like he has just not been quite the all-star level guy. Like, I, if, if you, he just, to me, like last year he was like an all-star. I think it was like a no-brainer. I just think like he has been, I, it has just not felt the same to me this year in watching him every night. I think that's a fair assessment. It just hasn't 100% been the same. I think part of it is that ankle injury that no one knew about than J.B. Bickerstaff slightly revealed um, during a pregame uh, media scrum. And then it kind of made sense. Like, oh, yeah, he does look like a little bit slower. It looks like he's lacking a little bit of the burst. Like, that explained it, too. But I do think a lot of it, though, is last year he was the second, possibly third option for Cleveland offensively. Uh, we talked about this a lot, but like Garland and Mobley establishing chemistry is huge, but like the Cavs have their bread and butter, old reliable pick and roll between Jared Allen and Darius Garland at the end of the day. And so that made him kind of the second natural option, especially as Mobley grew and learned how to play offense at the NBA level. But as you shift forward to this year, one, there's the Evan Mobley jump that like really puts him in, at three, but it's more so like just adding Donovan Mitchell to the fold is going to bump Jared Allen naturally down the pole, totem pole. And the third factor for me is just like Allen does have limitations to his offensive game. Like, sure, he takes three pointers every now and then in games, but like his efficiency is being a high rolling rim runner and just acts, act as an active law of threat in the pick and roll as well. Like, that is what he's best at, and that is how the Cavs best empower him. And I think that just has its limitations sometimes, too. Like, it's, threes are more than, worth more than twos, just based on my math as I'm thinking right now. Well, and, like, look, last year he was the main recipient of Darius Garland lobs. This year that has been Evan Mobley. Evan yeah. Mobley has kind of been the more frequent dunking partner when, when Darius Garland is throwing lobs. That is changing the way he gets his looks. And, and it, look, the ankle thing is, I think, a fair thing. Um, I, I also just think, like, here's this is just like a, 
I, I don't, I understand like why people don't want to talk about stuff in this way. And especially if you're like a fan and like want to get like defend your guys or whatever. Mm -hmm. But these things are not linear. Like your careers are not like even or like continually kind of going up. Even if it's like your favorite player, that's not how this works. How this works usually is like you, there's like a baseline that you will do and you could go a little bit down over the course of a year. You could go a little bit up and show some improvement. There are yeah. probably little things that Jared Allen and the coaching staff would tell you. They think Jared Allen is doing better than last year. I'm sure like we crunch all the numbers and like you'd find something where it's like, oh, like he's doing this a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But like this just feels like a year where like his last year was like a, a really high level. And now he's just like a little bit below that with some things changing. And the circumstances absolutely. I think like play a part in that. It's like where Evan yeah. Mobley is getting featured more. You bring in Donovan Mitchell, like the roster changes. The structure of the team is a little bit different. That's going to impact someone like Jared Allen. And it, it may be, maybe part of this for me is that it feels more notable than like how it felt with Isaac Okoro, where like Okoro's role is basically the same and it doesn't affect him really very much. Or like how Karis LeVert has like added stuff to his plate and done pretty well at it for the most part. Allen mm -hmm. just feels like it is like he's being like condensed into something a little bit different than what he was last year. And like that, that's also okay. He's still filling yeah. all of these gaps. It's just, it's a little bit different. And, and I think he's just been a little bit worse at it. Yeah, and I think when we talked about the adjustment between like Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell, like that was a huge one for the coming into the season, but it's also just the adjustment for everyone getting used to just like this new status quo and this new path for the Cavs. And you hit the nail on the head, like the like player development is very dynamic. It's not static, it's not linear, it moves all around and all over the place. Sign, cosine, tangent, whatever you want to call it, but Allen, I think, has performed well. I think defensively, he's still very much there. Maybe offensively, just being a, not the main priority has skewed things a little bit. But this is somewhat similar, not exactly similar to like when Kyrie and KD came to Brooklyn, because obviously DeAndre Jordan started over Jared for that brief time there together. But like <laughs> Jared what, Allen, what a funny, what a funny react. You know, it's like, hey, yeah, you know, we want we're gonna pay our guy DeAndre Jordan like ten million dollars. Well, we're gonna do years. right by our flaky franchise cornerstones and sign their best friend for a lot of money hilarious 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 very very funny stuff but it's somewhat similar to that though where like there's a little bit of shift and focus too where like maybe the Cavs just can't afford to like let Jared Allen try new things and experiment a little bit somewhat similar to Isaac Core where they're, they're like but not maybe not putting him in a box but maybe well since he's a large man it's a crate but it's a very loose crate and like there's opportunities for him to obviously bust out like he's had great games this year but also the Cavs are very cool with letting him be like that fourth, sometimes fifth banana on offense, depending on how Karis looks that night. Look, the other part of this, too, is I think I have that Celtics, that, that Celtics game in Boston in my head a little bit. Oh, the Celtics have given a blueprint to make Jared Allen seem non-impactful in games. And like, I, I don't think every team can do that, but Boston can. And that's like the power of bigger wings. I also think I also think it's fundamentally true that if they played Philly again, and you could have Jared Allen as the the main guy in Embiid, and Moby can help instead of having to have Darius Garland provide the help. Your defense probably looks better against Joel Embiid than it did against, uh, that, that it did the other night. If you were to see them in the playoffs or see them next year, Jared Allen obviously isn't yeah. like he's not going to sit on an island against Embiid. Like no one really can, and Jared doesn't have like the like he's just he doesn't have the bulk to do that. Nor does anybody. But like if you have him there as the guy on Embiid, and like Mobley is the help off of PJ Tucker. That is very different than Darius Garland having to, to dart in and help and swipe at the ball. And then you're rotating crazily around the shooters. Like It's just a different it's a different setup that way. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I also just think it's a different setup in the fact that like the Cavs more so rely on Jared Allen for his defensive impact and like the offensive upside's nice. But like you said, the fact that they use Mobley and Allen together so effectively, and I think also Mobley just emerging as a comfortably as a fifth big. One makes it a little less pressing in situations to play Robin Lopez, I feel like, or the equivalent of Robin Lopez next season. But the fact that like it's always going to be Jared Allen as a starting center, and you just figure out that stuff there, and so you don't have to have like the overactivity from some of the guards, and maybe eventually you find a little bit of a happy medium. We're not overtaxing the bigs either, but right now it's working for the Cavs. It's why they have arguably the top defense in the NBA. Yeah. All right. Today's episode is brought to you by Better Help. 
BetterHelp, by the way, can help you do great things. When you're at your best, you can do great things. And sometimes life gets you bogged down and you could feel overwhelmed or like you're not showing up in the way you want to. But working with a therapist can help you get closer to the best version of you. Because when you feel empowered, you are more prepared to take on everything life throws at you. You could feel down or overwhelmed or like you're not showing up. And, and all of that is really hard. If you're thinking about giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It is convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash lockdown today to get 10% off your first. That promo code's down right there. All right. Let Danny, Evan, let's talk about Danny Green. So Danny Green. Mm-hmm. If there was ever a game where Danny Green was going to play, it probably would have been the Philly game where he could have just guarded P.J. Tucker and shot threes. Not only that, but possibly not get blown past by George Niang um, in the end of like, the third quarter. And you, also would tr- just, you would trust Danny Green to make that rotation back and defend the shooter. Yes, just probably that's, yeah. I think logically speaking, just with how very good Danny Green still is defensively and the fact that he just has a wealth of knowledge in those situations and also... Does have a bit of a familiarity on how Doc Rivers and the Sixers run on offense at times. Like maybe he would have been a little bit of an X factor, but the problem is, I just, I just don't think he's a hundred percent. Again, JD kind of mentions some of this stuff pregame because the Cavs are a team that don't really have to reveal much unless they have to, and rightfully so. It's a competitive advantage thing. But Danny Green may not be a hundred percent still. He may be shaking a little bit of that rust. He is in his late thirties as well. So like he has a lot of things going against him and I don't think it's the offensive or defensive concept stuff. I just think it's health. And from the impression that JB gives and just maybe people around the team give like the Cavs are looking like, yeah, in those games against Philly, he would have been super useful, but maybe come playoff time, you don't have Jitty Osmond. If he's getting roasted, you can just flip to Danny Green instead and say, okay, Danny, you are other X factor because you are able to at least cover yourself defensively and provide spacing just as a spot up shooter. Yeah, it feels it feels like you're only going to see him like in a moment where you just like, all right, we need to we need to do something. You just you wonder what like how ramped up is he all that stuff. I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Are you surprised, Evan, that he hasn't like that he came in and hasn't really played? Uh, yes and no, no. Yes, in the aspect that like he addresses a pretty clear need of what the or what the Cavs just have right now, like the defense, especially on the perimeter and three point shooting. But no, I'm not surprised just in the fact that like when he's signing guys to ten D deals, you don't or sorry, vet men buyout yeah, deals buyout like guys. that. So my apologies, like or ditto for ten day deals if you want to talk about Sam Merrill as well. Like you don't you expect just, those guys to be like ha- Bingo, huge impact players. Evan Bingo, he mentioned Sam Merrill, Dylan Windler might be next. I don't know. Dylan, the idea of Dylan Windler is a pariah at this point, but and no disrespect to Dylan. Um, it's just like, other than Kevin Love starting for the Miami Heat, I can't think of a ton of buyout guys that are making huge impacts right now, or just historically speaking. Like, in this case, Danny Green is a good vibes vet. It replaces that mold Kevin Love was trying to fill for you. And yeah, he's maybe a little more impactful than Kevin Love is right now, but I just think he needs to be healthy in order to show that. All right, let's move on to Cavs Wizards. We'll wrap up with this. Evan, give me a, a, something to watch for in Cavs Wiz. Well, Jared Allen is out. Uh, he who shall not be named in the 10 days also out, and so is Isaiah Mobley. But for me, I want to see how the Cavs just kind of handle the Brad Beal, Kyle Kuzma situation of it all, just like how the Cavs can defend the Wizards and maybe just take care of business against a bad team before you have like a pretty decent stretch until you're in Brooklyn Tuesday and Thursday next week, which I will be at. Yeah. A uh, little program to Evan, just because of timing and things, it'll be, uh, we'll have Spencer German on for one of those episodes, which will be fun, and uh, we'll be doing some things to just fill some time, then we'll have Evan's, Evan dump about his time in Brooklyn. when he gets I'll back. have a uh, flannel and a handlebar mustache and everything when I come back. Just, yeah. And I'll be even more insufferably liberal than my mentions can handle. I want to see Evan Bobby defend Chris Epps Porzingis and just see how that looks in this game because Porzingis oh, is having a really nice. He's having a yeah. very nice year. I don't totally buy that it is like this like renaissance of Chris Epps Porzingis. I still think he is like like he would look good in like I Miami. Have take, I, I have a take I, on it. But, oh yeah, he looked good on Miami, but like I just think he's a dude taking advantage of the fact he's on a bad team. Yeah, and like he's talked about how like they've changed how we take where he take the shots and stuff, and he's like not like a bad player. It's just like 
I think how Mobley defending him, and particularly if like he doesn't have depending, they'll start Gafford I think in Porzingis. Um, I like I wonder what you kind of do with that. Like, do you just put Mobley on Porzingis and and have Lamar? Like, I like there's some funkiness there. I don't know exactly how you can back because Porzingis is seven one and playing power forward. But I Mobley defending Porzingis is like a I think like a very advantageous thing for Cleveland. Um, and uh, Accord defending Brad Beal and like you you should look the Cavs should just win this game. Honestly. They should. They should just win this game. Well, it'll be nice to see Mayor of Cleveland, um, Kyle Kuzma, make his return to Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse this season. All right, Evan, quick power rankings. We'll end on this. Just a little fun thing for Friday. Top five NBA players Cavs fans like to boo. I think Kelly Olynyk is still number one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, come on. It's Steph Curry's number one. Or okay, Kevin Dray- Durant. No, Draymond, Draymond, Draymond number is number one. Yeah, Draymond right. is number Draymond. one. I think, Olenek, I think Olenek literally might be two because the people are still really mad about 2014. Like we're like it is like he could be a hundred years old and being like honored for like like a with a Nobel Peace Prize in Cleveland and they would like boo that man I'm pretty sure. I mean that's true. When Art Modell passed away, the NFL didn't have a moment of silence in Cleveland for him because they knew the fans would just boo and the fans still booed because they knew they're having a moment of silence at 1:01 p.m. Not as not as hellacious as Philly fans but still petty nonetheless. Love you Cleveland, but um right. yeah Draymond Green's up there for sure. Draymond's probably one. Uh, like. I think I think Curry might be two. I think Olenek has to be three. And Bede might be up there now. Because they were like really uh, going to they I don't know, man. Like people like seem very recent about history, Joel yeah. And, I think even Kevin Durant would get more booze than Joel Embiid. And then maybe like the Toronto Raptors, because like they have yeah. just a rivalry with the Cavs. Yeah, I think my five would be Draymond. Steph and no, I'm not putting these in order. Draymond, Steph, Kelly Olynyk, Embiid, and Kuzma. That's fair. Marcus Smart gets an honorable mention. Oh for yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. And, and like the collective, the collective Toronto. Trey right? Trey Young as well. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. He did go full heel, but it's just like I've kind of this has been kind of a forget about Trey kind of season. All right, we're gonna end there. Well, that was an interesting tangent. Give us your top five of players you'd boo the most in the comments below, and be sure yeah, to subscribe. Yeah. Because yeah, you can please. win a Ricky Rubio bobblehead. No yeah, one wants again, to boo Ricky. The... Yeah, no, unbooable Ricky Rubio. Uh, gets to five thousand subs, we'll give away this Ricky Rubio bobblehead. Thanks again, everyone, for tuning in to Lockdown Cast for Friday, March seventeenth. I'm Chris Manning. That's Evan Darrell. Thanks again to BetterHelp, FanDuel, and um, and all of our great sponsors, Nissan. Great. Thanks again to Jake Stevens for producing. Thanks again to Asterator for the music. We'll talk to you on Monday, everyone. Be well. I certainly need the weekend, apparently.